Hello, this is Paul Check. Welcome back to my video blogs. Today I have something that I hope will be very interesting to you. It should be interesting to all of us since we're all in the world together and we're at a very interesting time in human evolution. And my concern is maybe that if we're not careful, evolution might turn into devolution. So, um, what I'd like to do to start our topic today, which is choice, good, evil, and insanity, is read quite a profound passage from a profound book called Destiny, Destiny and Control in Human Systems, Studies in the Int Interactive Connectedness of Time, or Chronotopology, by Charles Musez. Uh, that's what the book looks like. Just so you know, it's not light reading. There's a fair bit of math in it. It's uh, Musez is quite a evolved scientist in, in many fields, including language, mathematics, and others. But his writings are quite profound and lucid. I'm going to read a passage from this book because it sets the stage for what I'd like to share today. Um, this book was written in the 70s, I believe. It was published in 1985. So uh, the point is when he wrote this book, 1985, that was, uh, what, 85, 2005, 20 plus years ago, and, and the situations he's referring to are significantly worse today, as we will discuss. So. The passage I want to read you comes from page 153, and he says, now I'm cutting into a discussion just to keep it succinct, so, uh, but it'll make its point. Thus, all tyrannies are non-self-sustaining because tyranny, like all other manifestations of evil, is essentially parasitic. And if we omit love from our premises, we must need eventually become not only unreasonable and illogical, but irrational as well. Finally, clinically so. The human race, thus, finds itself in the unique and dubious distinction of becoming the first biological species able, if it continues on certain psychological conclusion, uh, conclu collision courses, to become insane. Fortunately, the diagnosis also indicates the remedy. So that's a pretty potent statement. I'm going to just read that last bit one more time for clarity. The human race thus finds itself in the unique, dubious distinction of being the first biological species able, if it continues on certain psychological collision courses, to become insane. Fortunately, the diagnosis also indicates the remedy. So that's a very, very important point that he's making and essentially saying if we keep doing the things that we're doing, then based on the concepts that I'll discuss here, we are uh, possibly going to be the first species ever in nature to become pretty much ubiquitously insane. I think it's important to remember that when you're dealing with issues of your own life, issues of relationship, and issues of the world, that choosing not to choose is choosing. So if we look at the things that are going on in the world and in our lives that are challenging, stressful, causing us to not have time to care for ourselves or care for others, then we can see that if we just keep doing the same things we've always done, we're going to get the same results that we've always gotten with that philosophy or ideology. So now I'd like to share some distinctions to help us get more clear on some of the issues at hand, and then I will talk about some of the solutions that I teach in my Holistic Lifestyle Coaching Program check level four and in the check four quadrant coaching mastery program which will be available online soon 
and I will be teaching more workshops from specific segments of that course in 2017 through the Czech Institute. So let's look here at the issue of good and evil. The word good can be connected in the sense of discussion that we're having today to the word moral. Morals are essentially codes of conduct that are life affirmative. So if you really look into what a moral is, though religion can use morality as a form of leverage and a means of controlling of people, we're talking about something more authentic than that. A moral is any code of conduct that is life affirmative. So for example, since we all need water, air, food, or the earth's soil, and we all need energy, warmth, and the ability to do things, to the degree that our choices, whether they be unconscious or conscious, uh, disable our ability to have clean water, healthy soils, clean air, and clean energy, then we are acting immorally. If we cannot have those things and share those things, we significantly decrease our survivability because we are decreasing the survivability of nature itself. And the shocking part of it is if we wipe out all the human beings within a relatively short period of time, the planet could repair itself and restore itself because the natural creative process of the earth is congruent with and in harmony with the universe and it is our powers of choice, conscious or unconscious, that are antagonizing nature's own balancing and healing forces. So, good choices then, in this context, are the ones that are life affirmative, and we have to always go to the basis of what sustains life, because buying a new car or a new iPhone or a bunch of cheap stuff at low discount prices that's made in China that contributes to the uh, destruction of the planet, China being uh, now seen as the most dangerous polluter of the world and the heaviest user of coal and many other things. Every single water source in China is now poisoned based on research. And we must remember that even though that's over there, Due to the hydrological cycle, all those toxins are just pumped through the atmosphere all over the planet, just like our toxins are here and anywhere else, whether it be nuclear reactors, etc. So when we're talking about life affirmative choices or good choices, we're talking about the kinds of choices that not only aid us in living well and living our dreams, but aid the planet in restoring its natural balance and the, the ability to sustain nature as, shall we say, the base of the pyramid of which human beings with their ability to control, create, or destroy would be at the top of. Evil, as I see it, is making choices that are immoral, immoral or anti-life. And interestingly, in one of my meditations, I was just looking at the word live on one of my diagrams and it dawned on me that when you read live backwards, it's E-V-I-L. So L-I-V-E -E, to live backwards is E-V-I-L. Now you could go into a long discussion on evil in many other contexts, but here I'm presenting evil as making choices that go against morality or the common good that supports all of our lives which is extremely important today because the problems that we are generating are so significant and require such a knowledge of basic biological systems such as the soil, the water, the atmosphere, farming, food, chemistry, and technologies that the children that are being raised today are so detached from these basic principles that you learn, for example, living on a farm, because if you don't live in tune with nature, unless you're doing the kind of chemical farming and genetically modified farming that we would call really uh, earth-based laboratories, uh, if you don't follow those natural principles, then you go broke and you starve to death. So we have to realize that children today who are largely raised with computer technologies, iPads, 
and digital information if they were stuck and had no choice but to go out into nature to try to find water, food, and survive, they would not have a chance at doing that. Where those of us that were raised on farms like I was and spent more time in nature uh, would have a better chance, but most of us are going to uh, be gone when the problems reach their pinnacle or will be too old to really participate fully. So now to distinguish good or morality from ethics, it's important to remember that ethics need not be moral. Ethics are classically um, part of any corporate uh, function or any corporate system or corporate policy. E ethics are part of the political system, the legal system, the medical system, the military, wherever there's policy, there's some kind of ethics, and they're often, unfortunately, immoral. Um, when I was a soldier in the 82nd Airborne Division, we had a soldier's manual, and it basically was a manual that says, who do you kill, and who do you not kill, and what ways do you kill them or not kill them? So there, I'm giving you a point, that's a code of ethics, but it is not a code of morality, since when we look deeply into what causes most of these wars, we don't find uh, any legitimate necessity. We find a lot of contrived stories being told and controlled by the media to encourage people to do things that are ultimately profitable for a small group of rich elite people, but destructive and dangerous and unprofitable for the rest of us. And this has been going on for a very long time, as most of you would know. So now what we want to do is look carefully at what is Charles Musez saying when we are at risk of being the first species to become insane. Well, insanity means a derangement of the mind. It means unsoundness, or excuse me, unsoundness of mind, the inability to think intelligently. Uh, freeing one from legal responsibilities as for entering into a contractual agreement. So this is an important issue because we have a moral, ethical, and we should have a legal responsibility to protect children, to protect our health, to protect our education system so it actually works to teach people how to think instead of programming them as to what to think. We have an ethical responsibility to protect the resources of the planet. We have an ethical responsibility to support life and there's something like two billion people on the planet right now that don't have food uh, or clean water, uh, many of which have been pushed out by large corporations such as destroying the rainforest to grow more soy, uh, rapeseed oil, and uh, beef for the fast food industry, which is extremely dangerous. And not only is it dangerous, it's, it's very, very sad when you see what happens to all the native populations living there and things like the, being able to light their water on fire, their drinking water, or women having to walk sometimes 30 kilometers and stand at a dripping tap that's been shut off by oil companies for hours and hours and hours to just get enough water to feed their kids and, and try to have some hygiene, which is shocking but true, and many documentaries highlight these things. So what we then find out here when we look at all this uh, insanity, it's also extreme foolishness, folly, senselessness, and foolhardiness. And where do we see these very distinctions of insanity uh, being used actively every day, often in the name of good, or the name of God, or the name of higher education, or the name of science, dot, dot, dot. We see this in religious manipulation and injustice, political use and manipulation of religion, the people of religion and the ideologies of religion, which goes back for as long as we've been writing about religion. I've studied this extensively. You can see, for example, if you look at the authentic teachings of Jesus and what is sold as the teachings of Jesus, they're radically different. If you study the Tao Te Ching interpreted uh, 
uh, by uh, Richard Wilhelm. He gives you a comprehensive expose in the book of how the Chinese rulers of the day manipulated Lao Tzu's teachings and others such as Confucius specifically to control people and implement a uh, profitable agenda, shall we say. So this is an old trick. Uh, dangerous adherence to authority in absence of tangible evidence in vivo. In other words, when people tell you that your kids need an MMR vaccination to be safe, yet the research as we see in Vax and now countless documentaries shows that these things are not safe and the list just goes on. I mean, this is, uh, you know, I could give you a long laundry list of these things, but in vivo means it's not, the scientific evidence that they claim does not turn out to be actually factual in life. An example I can give is when I was going to doctor's meetings and was in the hospital when Mana was about to be born, nurses and doctors ceaselessly tried around the clock to get us to sign up to have Mana injected. They want to give children here in California 72 injections by the time they're two years of age or something like that. And then naturally we said, no, we've done our research and they kept on going at us. But on three separate occasions, nurses pulled us aside in private and said, stick to what you're doing. I know they're trying to sell you these things, but you should know we see people in here, kids and adults every day that have exactly the illnesses that they were vaccinated for. So clearly they're not working and we see them causing lots of problems with people. So they were actually putting themselves at risk to encourage us to do what we were doing with our child. There was only three of the many that we came into contact, but three is enough from inside to say there is at least some wisdom hiding in the mold in that uh, barrel, so to speak. So then we have to look at issues of farming, food, medicine. Um, we have corporate issues. We have drug issues. We have vaccinations, which I talked about. We have issues of energy. Tesla gave us <laughs> and others the capacity for free energy, but if you study the whole, the whole energy debacle, it's all again power and control. We have issues over resources such as the earth, we have education problems, we have banking problems, we have politics issues. <laughs> all you're going to do is look at what's going on right now with Donald Trump and look at the fact that somehow he got voted in by enough people now, it may have been rigged, but that's still part of the whole process here because I'm, my point is Lao Tzu said the government always reflects the people. And this is what I meant when I said choosing not to choose is choosing. Well, when we get to the point where we don't have a candidate that's safe to vote for, then it's time for us to step in, stand up, and do what the women just did, which is march for women's rights. Do what Martin Luther King did, what Malcolm X did, and what many others had to do, whether it was to overcome slavery and Abraham Lincoln or overcome racism and Martin Luther King and overcome uh, control and abuse of their people as Gandhi took upon himself to free India from Britain. It's time for us to stand up and uh, get clear on what it means to be alive and what it means to love and what it means to be human, really, to be human. So when we look now at a model which I've modified from one of Musez's diagrams to make it more palatable, palatable in regard to the context of the presentation here, remember all religions, all world religions, essentially teach that God is love, and they also teach that God is omnipotent. Omni means all, so omnipotent means all-powerful, omnipresent means all-present, omniscient means all-knowing. So the highest form of love is unconditional love. Mathematically, that which is unconditional equals zero. Zero is no thing, yet the basis from which all things emerge, zero 
is by definition of being no thing, everything. Because something that has no border, no barrier, or definition, you could say, is a non-local, ever-present reality. And since all things countable emerge from zero, everything that is is an expression of unconditional love, and everything that is possible is contained in unconditional love as an option for us to choose. And creativity is a term that means to access our potential, zero, to create something that is tangible for all of us or moral or life affirmative. So now when we look at the mathematics, the unconditional zero has the potential to be less and less and less till there's nothing there. That would be the negative. The positive is it's the foundation of all things countable. So we have zero positive, the origin of something countable, and zero negative, which you could say the origin of the empty or debt. If you go less than zero, you have a negative. So what we want to look at now is that zero is the origin of the past, the present, and the future. Zero itself represents now or the present where the potential for life has to exist because if the potential was gone, everything would cease to exist at the instant that we were cut off from unconditional love. It's the power source. Now, minus one represents the future. The reason the future is represented as a minus one is because when we have a dream, a goal, an intention, or a desire, we have, shall we say, a negative image that we want to fill. For example, if you start a piece of art and you have an empty canvas, you have a negative image. It's in your mind, but there's an empty space within which you have the ability to express it as something positive and tangible. So the future, because we're moving toward our dream goals and objectives, is represented as negative one. The past is represented as positive one because if it's a positive, there's something already there. We have fossils. We know people were there. Animals were there. Uh, so we have accumulations, habits, conditioning, reflexes, memory, and we also have to realize that we have rigid thinking and behavior. And you can see that by looking back through the history books and seeing all the dynasties that got too opulent or hubristic and destroyed themselves, whether it be the Greco-Roman era, the Egyptian era, the Mayan, uh, whichever way you want to go, there, there's plenty of evidence that we've been down this track before. History shows that, that human beings have, with all their intelligence, managed to wipe themselves out to the point that very few people survived. I'm hoping we don't have to do that. Now, when we look at what our options are, positive one as a potential is conscious creativity. So this requires awareness. So when we're, if we're in totally unconditional love, then there is no consciousness of this or that because then there would be two. So unconditional love equals one because there's a negative and a positive to everything equals one. So the negative, yin, the positive yang, together equals zero. But when potential is actuated, then you have reality. And in reality, we always have empty space and solidity. An atom is largely empty but appears solid. So these two are always working together. But conscious, speaking of consciousness, if we're aware of something, we're positively aware. I'm aware that I'm talking to you here, so that would be a positive and an example of consciousness. I'm aware. So conscious creativity means that we can take through awareness the issues of habit, reflex, conditioning, and rigid thinking and behaviors from the past, and we can make better decisions that are more dream affirmative relative to what's needed for the protection of life or authentic moral choice at this time. If we go down into the negative one, we go into the unaware or the unconscious element of creativity. 
Arnold Patton says in his beautiful Universal Principles, which you can get at arnoldpatton.com, just look for Universal Principles. I use them with my clients and my students regularly. He makes a statement in one of his Universal Principles that's quite potent. He says, if something's happening in your life and you don't think you wanted it, look carefully at what you're choosing unconsciously. And that statement is quite profound and true. So if we're unconscious and we're creating unconsciously, remember our programming is at the unconscious level. So if we're creating relationship challenges repeatedly that we don't like, we're getting fired from jobs, or we keep buying cheap stuff from China, or we keep um, burning too much fossil fuels that's uh, not a good idea and pretending none of this is going on or even believing in scientific experts that have an agenda. Remember, scientists are now the world's uh, modern prostitutes. A huge percentage of scientists are on the payrolls of corporations that pay them not to do real science but to get the results they want to meet their ethics not their morals, which is a sales agenda largely driven by a board of directors who are largely the wealthiest people in the world who clearly have little concern for your well-being even though they pawn it off as such. For example, when I see a commercial by Exxon trying to show what they're doing for the environment, I'm like, you got to be kidding me. That's spin doctoring all the well. If you hadn't poisoned the oceans of the planet, you wouldn't even be running a commercial like that. So you can see all this kind of silliness going on. But we have to be aware in our personal life, in our relationships, in our collective existence on the world about what habits, conditionings, and reflexes we keep choosing unconsciously by ignoring and thinking, oh, you know, I'm driving my Hummer or my cool uh, V8 whatever, and I'm not really worried about the greenhouse effect because that's all bullshit. But when you actually look into the most conscious scientists, for which there are many, and the evidence that's been put forth, you can see that there's undeniable evidence. And this is just the same across the board. You look, whatever field you look into, you see you're being sold a bunch of bullshit, largely for one intention, which is making money. But we can't eat money. We can't drink money. We can't breathe money. And as songs have been telling us forever, money doesn't buy love. So we have to remember that happy people don't have the best of everything. They make the best of everything. And it's time for us to stop being instant gratifiers and pay attention to the fact that our choices have a ripple effect that goes all the way around the world when you're buying cheap junk to save money, but it's running factories in China that are poisoning the planet and poisoning the workers, we're not doing anything. If we listen to Donald Trump's agenda to make Americans a competitive workforce in the market, whether it be selling automobiles, sewing machines, iPhones, or whatever, I got news for you. We better start working at the ground level and start feeding people better, exercising them, teaching them how to meditate and use their mind. Or we're never going to compete in the world market. We've lost the car market to the Japanese because they're far more productive than we are and a lot less scattered with regard to a lot of these issues. And the list goes on. We've had to outsource manufacturing, not only because it's more profitable to get slave labor, but because Americans aren't able to effectively produce high quality products relative to the third world people that we often in our culture think are not that intelligent. But lo and behold, they're kicking our ass. The key point is, if Donald Trump's really serious, closing the borders off and winding up the war machine and drilling for oil is really not going to do anything but keep us sicker and more closer to insanity. And as a business owner, and many business owners would confirm this, we have a hard time getting responsible, capable people that aren't sick all the time, that can read directions, that can help produce a product and contribute to a creative thinking process so that even a health-oriented company can grow. So we really are on a tipping point 
and we're indoctrinating our children into many dangerous practices, and one of the most dangerous of all is believing in authority figures as though they were gods. So when we take this, we have unconscious creativity, which leads to what happened. Oh shit, not this again. And typically we blame it on somebody else, which is the sign of a child, not someone who's looking in and taking responsibility for their 50% of any relationship. So how do we take all this very straightforward, logical information into our lives? Well, as I've said probably a thousand times <laughs> on blogs and alone, I spent my whole life developing this stuff and working on this and living, eating, sleeping, and breathing it and meditating on it and doing Tai Chi on it and artistic renderings and studies. And the formula that I find clinically tried and tested for many, many years is one we must first have our dream goal, objective, or inspiration or motive, which goes right here to future dreams, goals, intentions, and desires. Two, there's two forces that create the whole universe, the male and the female, female yin, male yang. Those forces are the, shall we say, the base creative elemental and energetic possibility accessible to all of us. And we must seek to balance the male and the female within ourselves. We're in a very, very masculine dominant, uh, dominated uh, time in, in our history and in our culture. We're highly patriarchal and even as a man I can say it's very very dangerous because the male nature is to to hunt, to kill, to succeed, to build bigger, to have more, more power, more control. Uh, well you know just look at Donald Trump and you've got a perfect exemplification of male energy run wild um, and forgive me, men, for criticizing men with that. And, and I have to accept my responsibility because there's some Donald Trump in all of us, and I'm working on healing my Donald Trump every day, and I hope you guys are too. Three, we have to make choices. There's only three choices you can make. The optimal choice, which is best for everybody involved. Who's on your dream team? You, if you look honestly into these issues, you will find that any choice you make has an effect on everyone, whether you know them or not. I won't elaborate on that. I don't think I need to. Four, what are the, the four doctors? Doctor happiness, being clear on what your dreams, goals, objectives, and desires are, and then putting them into action. Doctor movement, movement of body, mind, emotions, and objectives, moving things into action, affirmatively contributing. Diet, which in my system boils down to what I call the echo, the energy sources, the chemistry that you create in your body, how well hydrated you are, which goes back to that magic thing called water, and which organisms you eat, and you can only eat what's being grown. So if we keep growing dangerous, sick animals, ruining their lives and poisoning them and having them live in their own feces their entire life and poisoning our water supplies, poisoning our groundwater, using genetically modified products, massive amounts of antibiotics that ultimately end up in your body and create antibiotic resistance and all that kind of stuff, well, then we're not thinking very far ahead. We're not saving money, we're not saving time, we're being unethical and immoral to animals, to plants, to soil, and so we're at the point now where we can't keep playing the game. That's really, I'm, I'm not here to be a doomsdayer, but I have to be realistic. I spent my entire life studying these fields. I was raised on a farm. I know how these things work, and you know, if you want to learn about farming, go talk to a farmer. If you want to learn about ecology, talk to an ecologist. If you want to learn about uh, love, talk to a Sufi. <laughs> so I've been there and done these things, and this is my own synthesis. And I have an 11-month-old child, so I'm obviously concerned about these things. Um, and I know all of us should be. Uh, so 
then you get, once you're at this four doctors, we must remember that what we do for ourselves is 50% of every relationship we have with another person. If you're in a relationship with a, a spouse or a, a boyfriend or a girlfriend or anybody, a business relationship, you're responsible for 100% of 50% of the relationship. If it's me, I have to be 100% there, you have to be 100% there, or we can't really connect to each other and communicate effectively. If you show up and you're 10% not present, there's 10% of you I can't know. So there's 10% of you you can't access, there's 10% of you I can't know, it creates a 20% deficit. If both of us are 10% absent, it creates a 40% deficit. So what we find out is when we're making unconscious choices at the level of our own choices, it reciprocates itself and mirrors itself as unconsciousness of double proportions in all of our relationships, which leads to a lot of problems, a lot of stress, a lot of woulda, shoulda, coulda, didn't, it's your fault, which leads to anxiety, depression, and a massive consumption of medical drugs instead of actually getting to the root of the problem. And so whatever we do at the level of I manifests in our relationships around us, which ripple out, and there's a thing called six degrees of separation, which has been shown to be true, that we are actually only six people away from anybody in the world. So if you want to get a hold of someone and you really make intelligent choices about who might be able to access that person, most of us can get to anybody within six people. That's called six degrees of separation. So we're only six degrees of separation from even the people with no cell phones, starving to death, drinking water with oil in it because Exxon Valdez and Shell and other companies have destroyed it and don't ever let you know about that. And interestingly, these corporations own the media, so they only let you see what it is that you want to see. In fact, I was just told by somebody today from first-hand experience that just came to the United States and said that they were the border control was asking people if they were coming to the presidential inauguration or they were coming to be a protester. And if they were a protester, the border was turning them back and not letting them in. Well, there's Donald Trump's first definition of border control. If you don't want to play the game his way, you have no freedom of speech. You don't even get to come into the country. This is the kind of shit, excuse the expression there, that we've got to stand up against and we've got to get creative together. And really, I hope all of you understand what I'm saying here. I'm not trying to say get rid of technology. I'm saying use technology intelligently. I'm not saying not to have fun. I'm saying balance yourself so you can have more fun. I'm not saying not to eat. I'm saying to eat good food, but don't waste food. I'm not saying not to farm. I'm saying farm intelligently and express enough love to the animals and the creatures that support us to at least give them a life where they can roam and move and live free range, if you will, so that there is a sense of not taking life away unnecessarily. And the list just goes on. If we educate people on how to think instead of what to think, as all these academic institutions do at large, we will then educate people to have the problem-solving tools in order to be productive in helping restore balance and harmony to the world and to nature and to man. And that's what the entire Czech Institute's training is all about, is learning how to think, not being told what to think. So we're in a, a very interesting time. We have a lot of opportunities. Um, and if you want some resources to help you get yourself unstuck from this unconscious quagmire, which all of us have some degree of, PPS Success Mastery Lesson 1, How to Find and Live Your Legacy, which means your overarching dream, takes you through a, a series of exercises to look inside your past experiences, positive and negative, show you how to shine some light of consciousness on that and establish a sense of clarity of direction and learn how to put things in context so what may be currently limiting you or putting you in victim mode or self-sabotage or 
encouraging you to live yourself as a prostitute and work for money instead of doing what you really love to do can be put into context and give you an idea of what you can do to live your dream now. And it also shows you how to identify the 10 key components that are essential to knowing what your dream is in any situation. PPS lesson two is all about self-management. I show you how the mind is programmed, the science of brainwashing and how to use your awareness and the very knowledge that's used against you to get rid of all the negative and fearful thinking and become um, capable of keeping your mental, emotional energy directed in the direction of your dream while simultaneously being conscious enough to be aware that we have a relationship and a responsibility to each other because even seemingly personal choices ultimately overflow into relationships and all of our relationships. Then we have my multimedia ebook, The Last Four Doctors You'll Ever Need, How to Get Healthy Now, which shows you the basics of four doctor living and guides you to developing your own core values so you know when to say yes and when to say no in relationship to all these types of issues. And my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, which has now uh, got, I think we've sold around 150,000 copies, which is good news, uh, gives you self-assessments and instructions for how to balance your key body systems, how to stretch and mobilize your body, and how to uh, use exercise as healing. And uh, it has exercise programs specifically based on how stressed your body is so that you don't over train yourself or injure yourself with exercise and can use breathing and movement to bring yourself back to health and balance. Thank you for joining me today. I hope you enjoy looking into these things, thinking about these things, and being the change. Uh, on Wednesday, January the 25th, 2017, day after tomorrow, I will be giving a webinar called Take Back Your Health 2017, and I will show you ways we can work individually and collectively to guide and direct large corporations and governments back into a moral code of conduct as opposed to an ethical corporate agenda. Thank you for joining me. I will see you again soon. I'm Paul Check.